I think the most important thing for me in this introduction is the integrity and the importance of his message. His word is very important for us today. In this time, in this season in our country, in this time in the Church of Jesus Christ, he has a word for us. I know something about that word, and it is very, very important. It's so important for this seminary in this place. Uh, earlier this afternoon, uh, some of you may have heard Dr. Braxton say a few things, and he said, you know, sometimes he's disinvited from places because he talks about things like white liberal privilege or liberal white privilege. I'm, I'm afraid to say we have in this place some white privilege not even liberal, okay? <laughs> All right, so, and, and some of us are beginning to understand that, but let me say to you, please, and please hear me as honestly as I can say, you will always be at home here in this place, as long as you teach us to say yes, and as long as you make it clear to us that all flesh, all flesh, all people will receive God's salvation. Please join me in welcoming the Reverend Dr. Brad Braxton. Gracious God, give me now the eye of the eagle that I may see clearly into the joys and sorrows, the hopes and the hurts of your people with the bonds of the Holy Spirit. Weave my hands to the gospel plow and tie my tongue to truth so that when we leave this place, folk will be talking about the goodness of the Lord. In your name we ask it all. Amen. Amen. President Esterline is what is right about theological education and ministry. And I thank God for your friendship. And I'm so excited about what you are doing in this marvelous institution. Many thanks to you and to all of your colleagues for the extraordinary hospitality that I have received during this visit. Let's get down to the business at hand. There is an outline that has been prepared for you, street corner religion, public theology for a pluralistic world, the outline on the front, some text in the back. As I did this afternoon, permit me once again to bring you greetings from the people I am privileged to pastor at the Open Church of Maryland, a congregation committed to radically inclusive love, courageous social justice activism, and compassionate interfaith collaboration. As I like to say, at the Open Church, we're doing our best to help people know that we are all sacred siblings trying to learn how to play together in Mama God's living room. Yes. The title of my lecture is Street Corner Religion, Public Theology for a Pluralistic World. And if you help me, I won't have to work quite so hard. In the eighth chapter of the Hebrew Bible book, Nehemiah, there is a remarkable scene of public piety and cultural solidarity. The carnage and chaos of the Babylonian exile is a fading memory. The Persian king has issued an edict of emancipation permitting the people of Israel to return to their homeland in order to restore the temple, build up Zion's walls, and reform the ways of the people so that they might walk again in the newness of life. Ezra, the priest and scribe, rightly recognizes that exterior renovation apart from spiritual maturation, will not usher in lasting national transformation. So after Jerusalem's sacred architecture is restored, Ezra initiates 
a covenant renewal service so that the faith of God's people might be as firm as the stones in Zion's walls. Listen to the biblical description of this sacred ceremony. All the people gathered together in the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. He read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. This passage presents a religious ceremony with theological implications. However, for our purposes tonight, I am not simply interested in what is happening in Nehemiah 8. I am also interested in where it is happening. We know what is happening in Nehemiah 8, biblical interpretation. But we often ignore the where in this text. The where is the public square outside the water gate. The Hebrew Bible scholar Gene Tucker explores the significance of this location. He writes, and I quote, the location of the ceremony in Naramiah 8 is striking. Now that the rebuilding of the temple and the wall is done, where do the people hold their service and carry out their interpretation of the will of God. Out in the city, in the public square before the water gate, not in the new temple or even its outer courts, but on a street corner in the middle of the everyday political, legal, and economic life of the ordinary people, end quote. In short, Nehemiah 8 depicts public theology, or said more simply, it shows us street corner religion. Religion that refuses to be quarantined in the holy halls of sanctuaries or seminaries. Street corner religion. Religion that dares to move out into the hood where hell and hatred are having a field day. Street corner religion. Religion that boldly yet humbly seeks to interpret the gracious and demanding ways of God in, with, and for our common life together. Not just a good life for a small group of like-minded people, but rather the flourishing of the entire planet and its marvelously diverse forms of life. As a homiletician and biblical scholar, I am quite at home with street corner religion. I count it an honor to have preached in sprawling cathedrals and to have lectured in elite universities and seminaries, but the God I know and serve is more likely to show up in the blood-stained alleys and streets than the inside stained glass walls of pristine chapels and lecture halls. All of this talk about street corners brings to mind another important theological term at the center of my work. And that word is hermeneutics. 
I know it's one of those seminary sounding words. <laughs> but when you really break it down, it has street meaning. Hermeneutics is related to the Greek messenger god Hermes. Hermes was the god who had wings on his hat and wings on his shoes. Let me make it plain. Hermes is the logo for the flower company FTD. In ancient mythology, Hermes was the god who traveled, taking messages between Mount Olympus, where the gods resided, and the earth where the people lived. Hermes was the god of the go-between. He was a brother of the boundaries. His assignment was to assist different groups of people in understanding each other better. So Hermes was the street god, the one making connections between seemingly unrelated realities. Similar to Hermes, hermeneutics is street work. It's the art and science of making connections, establishing links, creating roads and intersections between seemingly unrelated things. Hermeneutics, constructing roads between ancient biblical text and contemporary problems. Hermeneutics, building boulevards between different cultures, denominations, and religions. <laughs> Hermeneutics, hooking up wisdom from the lecture hall and the pool hall. I thank God that PTS is gonna be a place that trains preachers who are not scared of the pool hall. My work as a pastor has also taught me the value of street corner religion. Street corner religion emphasizes the development of godly relationships amid social diversity. Streets are sites of intersections, and intersections imply plurality, the convergence of different people, experiences, and ideas. Street corner religion should facilitate people's ability to safely navigate cultural crossroads without committing vehicular homicide. <laughs> when people recklessly converge at crossroads, destruction and death can occur. However, when crossroads work positively, they facilitate travel and allow people going in the wrong direction to find new directions. Let me be abundantly clear. Enabling constructive encounters with diversity is a primary pastoral task of congregations and theological institutions. In case you haven't figured it out yet, Theologically, I am a pluralist. I believe there are many religious and cultural traditions around the globe that provide a variety of authentic ways to achieve liberation, salvation, and the flourishing of the planet. If theology is to have any significance in our public life, Theology must creatively and consistently demonstrate that valuing, not vilifying diversity, valuing, not vilifying diversity, is the great moral assignment of our generation. Diversity, from just immigration reform that protects the humanity of Latino and Latina persons, to the right of Muslims to build a mosque in lower Manhattan, to the full inclusion and empowerment of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender persons 
not only in seminaries, but in our congregations. Diversity is a gift from God. Having characterized some commitments of street corner religion, I now discuss the evangelical dimensions of public theology. I use the term evangelical in the sense of the Greek word from which it is derived, euangelion, which means simply good news. Evangelical is not a term exclusively identifying a particular segment of Christianity. Rather, it refers to a broad set of practices and beliefs that seek to bear witness to God's good intentions for and good gifts to the world. Regardless of how religious people label themselves, conservative, moderate, progressive, a concern for the evangelical should be at the heart of our theological work. Of the countless sermons proclaimed regularly in this nation, one might legitimately wonder how good the supposed good news really is, especially for persons ensnared by serious social problems. There is a homiletician, Andre Reznor, who suggests that clergy often fail to explain what they mean by the good news. Reznor remarks, and I quote, my experience in listening to sermons in various churches and preaching classes in seminaries has shown me that this one assumption, that preachers know what the gospel is, is too big an assumption to make. Are we educating leaders who are unclear about what is good about their good news? <laughs> Lest I replicate the dilemma about which Reznor speaks, I now present my conception of the gospel, which is on your outline. This is a working draft. So I ask for all of you public systematic theologians to give a brother some grace. <laughs> the gospel is the story of God's righteous intentions for the world. God's loving involvement with the world and God's future reign over the world. A commitment to this story entails the pursuit of righteousness, the formation of loving relationships and a spiritual posture that leans toward hope. There are several theological implications of my description of the gospel. First, let me explore the nuances of my phrase, God's righteous intentions. Here, I use righteous in the sense of the Greek adjective, dikaios. This adjective can be translated righteous or just. It connotes God's unwavering commitment to justice. God has always desired that relationships characterized by justice be normative. In short, the gospel is about justice. Admittedly, justice can be a nebulous term. Two scholars have refined my reflections on justice. Practical theologian Carol Hess contends, and I quote, justice involves dispersing power among those who differ from one another. In many of the Protestant churches that I often inhabit for lectures and consultations, I'm always interested in those congregations who talk about justice, but they never share the microphone. <laughs> At least in versions of Protestant Christianity, the microphone is arguably the most potent symbol of power. And isn't it interesting, the games we play with the microphone, if you are one gender or you come from one status, you might be able to speak from down on the floor. Maybe you can come to the lectern that's two up here, but no, you can't go to the big desk. <laughs> a 
Are we interested in creating radically democratic spaces where the microphone is shared? As I shared with clergy leaders from the community earlier today, arguably the most important justice act I have engaged in as a pastor over the last six months is I taught a seminary level introduction to preaching course in my congregation. 30 preachers who have now seminary level training in preaching the gospel and those saints are preaching the paint off the walls. That is not just an act of stirring up the gifts and equipping the saints. It's actually an act of radical democracy. It is my way of saying in a world where justice rules, I can't be the only one that has regular access to the microphone. So justice involves dispersing power among those who differ from one another. The justice dimension of the gospel also invites clergy and congregations to ask, how does God regard the imbalance of social power in our local, national, and global communities? How does God view the imbalance of power? And I say very clearly, especially given that there are so many sisters and brothers in the house tonight from, broadly speaking, black religious traditions, that perhaps for the first time ever in its history, black religious institutions and particularly black churches are in trouble of God snatching the lamp and the lampstand from them. Doing all this justice talk and perpetuating, as Teresa Fry Brown says, an ecclesial apartheid based on gender. The black churches will have to spend, many of them, 30 days in hell for how they have treated women. Did I make that clear? I try to be clear when I lecture. And as I said at the Proctor Conference, dealing with justice last year, I am so perturbed with black male clergy who galvanize around Ferguson and Chicago, but turn an eye this way, knowing that the chairman of the deacon board beat his wife last night. <laughs> Talking about justice, ginning up all this, and presiding over the vilest injustice in your own house. Let me calm myself down here. Let me calm myself down. <laughs> See, y'all, this is the last lecture. I'm leaving tomorrow, so I'm just going to drop it like it's hot. <laughs> so if you're going to have a justice witness, have a holistic justice witness for the flourishing of all the people in your care, and not just justice when you think it might get you on CNN. <laughs> Furthermore, the biblical scholar Elsa Tamez suggests that justice involves reciprocity and the necessity to restore the poor, weak, and oppressed to a full human condition. What if our churches were as concerned about the human condition as they are protecting Jesus? Jesus can handle himself. You worry about the people. Love the people, restore the people, heal the people. That's justice work. Second, when I speak about God's involvement with the world, I am underscoring God's tenacious love. This love compels God to enter into risky, even sacrificial interactions with the world. God is willing to endure great suffering with those whom God loves. In short, the gospel is about love. The love dimension of the gospel invites clergy and congregations to ask, in the name of God, what will we risk and do without in order to promote the flourishing of others? If your ministry is about love, 
you ought not be leading all the time with how favor is going to bless you with abundance. As I said to leaders this afternoon, I don't know a preacher more blessed and highly favored than Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> I get so tickled. How you doing? Blessed and highly favored. Can't you just say fine? <laughs> Man, deep Christian. I mean, people just so deep, deep in Jesus. Just deep, deep, deep. Jesus was blessed and highly favored. <laughs> and Good Friday was a trip. <clears throat> Can I show you what blessed and highly favored looks like? Oh, I wish I had a praying church in here tonight. They hung him high and they stretched him. So the question is, does your love ethic compel you to risky engagement on behalf of other people? Third. The reference to God's future reign over the world accentuates the political nature of the gospel. The gospel is never simply an affair impacting the interior souls of individuals. The gospel also encroaches upon structures of power. To paraphrase the biblical scholar N.T. Wright, to announce that God is the ruler is also to announce that Caesar is not. Consequently, the gospel empowers a hope-filled existence which declares to the visible and invisible principalities and powers that their days are numbered. In short, the gospel is about politics. One of my mentors early in my ministry said something to me that changed my life forever. He said to me, biblical interpretation is an act of politics. And as a biblical scholar, as Krista Stendhal once suggested, I have to be mindful of the public health consequences of my biblical interpretation. Depending on how a text is interpreted, somebody may end up being battered or beaten or desecrated. So to read a text, especially in public, is a profound ethical and political act. So here's the question. If ultimately we are more accountable to God than to governments or the culture, what social practices should we embrace and which should we reject? Not everything that the traditions have bequeathed to us are holy. And one of the things that faith-filled communities must do is learn when there are orthodoxies that are outdated and must be critically examined and perhaps humbly discarded even as we hold on to some old landmarks. When clergy and congregations articulate and embody the gospel, their actions infuse religious imagination and moral reasoning into the public dialogue. I'm wondering, based on the tremendous incivility in our public life, is that not in some small measure a critique of our ecclesial work. How can you have this level of incivility and rancor and bigotry with the number of Christians we have who weekly proclaim the gospel? Has our salt lost its savor? Jesus said just that, be the salt of the earth. Oh, speaking of Jesus, Perhaps you notice that my definition of the gospel does not explicitly name Jesus. Jesus is nowhere to be found. Let me say it another way. Jesus is semantically absent, 
but spiritually present in the definition. The name Jesus is not there, but the mission for which God sent Jesus is very much there. The task of public theology is to help people define the gospel and the sacred in ways that do not separate us. As the educator and activist Verna Dozier once wrote, sin is separation. Conceptions of God's good news that unnecessarily, narrowly, and violently separate people are sinful. Thus, let me return to my description of the gospel. By omitting Jesus' name, I make more room for others to collaborate with me in creating common ground for a better world. But the omission is not absence. I don't have to name Jesus for the spirit of Jesus to be present. Public theology for a pluralistic world must puncture the presumptuousness of arrogant religion thereby permitting the hot air of self-righteousness to be replaced by the warm air of God's spirit that inspires genuine righteousness, cross-cultural empathy, and constructive interreligious engagement. Conversely, if I use the name of Jesus as a violent weapon to separate insiders and outsiders, the saved from the unsaved, the name of Jesus might be present, but the spirit of Jesus is absent. Street corner religion must insist on a new declaration of independence. And this declaration of independence is my way of taking seriously my wonderful life-giving encounters with African traditional religion. I wrote this book several years ago called No Longer Slaves. And I had a lot of controversial stuff I had written in there seemingly about the Bible and biblical authority and what it means to argue with the Bible. And folk got all excited and ginned up over some of that, and they missed what I thought was the most delicious line in the book. I had so much fun writing the line, I would write it and then erase it and write it again. It was so fun to write. <laughs> it was delicious. And the line went something like this. The first place that black folk met God was not at the foot of the cross. fascinated by black religious and specifically black Christian understandings of God that can be so narrowly focused on Jesus that they neglect the beauty and brilliance of religious and moral traditions that existed for millennia before the colonizers came with Christianity. So you don't have to get mad at me. I'm just channeling the ancestors tonight who said as 18th century American freedom fighters sought independence from Britain's colonial yoke, there was a edict, a declaration of independence. Well, in the 21st century, faith communities need to declare their independence from the yoke of fundamentalism. Fundamentalism poses a serious threat to global harmony. When I speak of fundamentalism, I am not identifying a particular segment within a religious community. Rather, I mean an overall approach to reality that takes one culture's criteria for truth and lifts those criteria up as absolute. Fundamentalism flattens the world and makes no room for nuance and robust, complex truth. So fundamentalism takes cultural philosophies such as white privilege and patriarchy and invests them with divine mandates. For example, as I have alluded, many congregations perpetuate apartheid on the basis of gender. 
I believe that the Apostle Paul, in the letter of 2 Corinthians, provides insights for how to declare our freedom from fundamentalism. Now, again, I'm pursuing this in a meaningful way for the larger public good, but also with the sense of how what I'm saying can especially appeal to black religious communities. I am stupefied by the bibliolatry in black churches. People worship the Bible as if the Bible is God. And that is profoundly un-African. When the colonizers came to the continent and said to Africans, we have God in a book, the Africans said, you crazy. You can't contain God in a book. God is in family. The spirit of God is running in those rivers. It's in sunrises. It's in death and childbirth. God in a book? But after a while, through enough gin and guns and tribal infighting, I guess they were fighting over who preached to more acres and Negroes. Guess what happened? The colonizers gave the Africans the Bible and they took the land. So whenever black people in particular are so enamored with the book and not the God who stands behind the book, dump, because the shit is about to hit the fan. I believe 2 Corinthians may help us. The deep issue in 2 Corinthians is epistemology. That's another seminary word that simply means how we know and think. Epistemology is to ask this question. What characteristics allow us to know truth from falsehood? What Paul is saying is if there is going to be a new world, a world of public theology and the common good, there must be new ways of thinking about the world. Second Corinthians chapter three in particular is a call for repentance. The apocalyptic action that transforms our thinking. One of the most revolutionary and courageous acts, especially in faith communities, is to change your mind. So in second Corinthians chapter three, verses 12 through 18, Paul identifies an obstacle that must be removed. He calls it the veil. The veil distorts how we know. The veil prevents us from seeing people as people. What Paul suggests in this text is that a relationship with Jesus Christ removes the veil and gives us a new orientation. So now, given my apprehension about fundamentalism, my interest in 2 Corinthians may seem strange. This passage appears to support a kind of fundamentalism. Paul basically seems to say, if you want the veil removed, if you want to think right, if you want to perceive the world right, this only happens in Jesus. That makes me very uncomfortable. Because if the veil is raised only through Jesus, then this passage becomes another instrument of fundamentalism, where only Christians have proper perception. To avoid the dangers of fundamentalism, Paul appeals to the language of the spirit. Listen to verse 17. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. In the third chapter of John's gospel, Jesus says, the spirit blows where it wills. The chief hallmark of the spirit 
is transgression of our boundaries. You most often know when the spirit is at work, when the wind starts blowing in ways that blows our orthodoxies in all kind of strange places. And the spirit's ultimate concern is the last word in the Greek text and the English translation of 2 Corinthians 3.17. Eleutheria, freedom. Where the spirit is, there is freedom. Thus, attempts to restrict sacred truth to any one religious scheme create inhospitable conditions for the spirit to work. Let me put it down on the ground in a public theology kind of way. In Jesus, I have all the God some days I can stand, but I do not have all the God there is. Others also have sacred truth. Those who practice African traditional religion, those who seek right relationships with God through the Quran and the Torah. Indeed, at the open church, one of our board members on the board of directors is a mid 30 year old out lesbian agnostic. I have found more godly grace in the witness of that audacious white woman than some of the churchified going Christians I've spent a lot of my life listening to. There's some pastors I won't go to lunch with, but I'll go to jail with Heather. She's on the board. She serves the Lord's Supper. She presides at the welcome table. I don't know if Heather believes in all the stuff I believe in, but she believes in the dignity of the spirit that is moving in the world. Maybe it's the human spirit. Maybe it's the divine spirit. But she's a woman concerned about freedom. And so I'm hanging out with the freedom crowd. I'm not hanging out with people who are checking the litmus card to make sure that I believe in Jesus. Man, I'm glad I'm getting out of Pittsburgh tonight. <laughs> Boy, because y'all froze up on a brother like for real. <laughs> Whatever. I will. Thank you. What I'm arguing is, is that part of public theology is can we do theology in a way that honors the best of our particularity but does not engage in idolatry? Can we construe of being God's people in ways that are gracious and that make room? We wonder why our churches are empty. There's not a gracious invitation that says, come sit with us. I'm not going to force any Jesus down your throat. Come sit with us. Come live with us. Come love us. And along the way, we're going to meet Jesus and a whole lot of other sacred operators. And after a while, all of us might get saved again and again <laughs> and again. What you telling me? You only got saved one time? Maya Angelou likes to say, when people say, I'm a Christian, she says, already? Part of the public theology task is to say to cocky, Bible-thumping preachers and congregations, you are Christian already? Ironically, Heather, the agnostic lesbian who helps to lead the congregation I helped to found, has helped me to know more about Jesus and preaching than hardly any other person in that congregation. In light of the looks on your faces, I want to very quickly, <laughs> I want to very quickly, this is for me, this is not for you. I want to talk very quickly about promoting public safety. In the final instance, public theology must ensure safety in the public square. Many television programs provide striking examples, especially right through in here, of public incivility. Inflammatory rhetoric can heat up ratings, but does little to illumine a path toward the transformation of public values and public policies. 
We have witnessed in recent years, and now even months, horrific incidents where snipers and bombers shoot and maim people in public places such as schools and office buildings and airports. The moral outrage about such events is swift and insistent. We must become equally adamant about the safety of public conversations, refusing to tolerate character assassinations by the tongues of rhetorical snipers. So on my way out of here, <laughs> I want to articulate some values that may help to ensure safety and civility in our public life. So whether as a faith community or a seminary, you're talking about immigration reform, the moral and civic equality of LGBT people, issues with Israelis and Palestinians, the goal is not to always try to shoehorn complex moral debate into unanimity. Rather, the ethical challenge is, how do we create rules of engagement that allow for civil and safe and courageous conversations to occur, such that if people saw us arguing, they would walk away and say, those people are holy. Even as they disagree, there's a holiness in how they handle themselves. I offer these rules of engagement. First, Demonstrate intellectual charity. The word charity is a synonym for unconditional love, agape. Jesus said, love your enemies. The true test of unconditional love is our ability to treat well those who are diametrically opposed to us. It is an intellectual form of love. Jesus transforms love from the sphere of emotion to the sphere of the will. It's a love you will have to think about. Too often in public conversations, we listen superficially to the opinions of others just long enough to create a caricature and to dismiss those persons with haste and hostility. Second, show Compassion. Compassion is related to the Greek verb pasco, which simply means to suffer or endure. Compassion often begins with the simple question, why does this person or group hold certain perspectives? Compassion may not produce kindred spirits, but it will produce kinder speech as people wrestle with difficult topics. My daddy, the best pastor I ever knew, gave me this moral wisdom. Son, if you're gonna err, err on the side of righteousness. If you're gonna make a mistake, make the mistake of being too kind. Being too kind is not a career-ending mistake. You can come back from people saying, the worst fault of this church is that these people are just too doggone kind. <laughs> Finally, practice hospitality. Hospitality honors one's neighbors. A compelling gesture of hospitality is contained in that Sanskrit greeting. When people meet one another in India, namaste, the sacred in me greets the sacred in you. We don't have to have an orthodox or Christological conversation. I just want to honor and bless the image of Mama God in you. Speaking of hospitality, you have shown me gracious hospitality through your generous listening. 
let us be on our way. This lecture hall is beautiful. But the alley philosophers that I hang out with in Baltimore told me to tell you <laughs> that the streets are calling us in the name of God and for the sake of God's good news. Get out of here and then meet me on the corner. Namaste. Namaste.